And the Oscar goes to. We've arrived at the 25th film in this series. Yes, it only took me five years to get to this place. Ah, God, I'm going to be doing this forever. Oh well, I'm happy to do it. And why shouldn't I be happy? 1953 was the first year the award ceremony was broadcasted on television. This is indeed a wedding of two great entertainment mediums. With uh, motion pictures and television. And with Oscar 25 years old, it's high time he got married. Not only that, but it marked the first time two color films won in a row. The Greatest Show on Earth was also directed by the great Cecil B. DeMille, the man best known for biblical epics like The King of Kings, Cleopatra, and two versions of The Ten Commandments. The Greatest Show on Earth also stars one of the best known actors of all time in his fourth ever film role, which shot him to stardom, and the movie is almost completely crap. In order to keep the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus going a full season and prevent anyone from being fired, General Manager Brad Brandon, played by Charlton Heston, must do two things. Make sure the traveling show continues to make a profit at all of its stops, and hire on the great Sebastian, played by Conan Wilde, as the circus's new star. Brad doesn't want to hire Sebastian, who's known as a womanizer and troublemaker that can significantly disrupt troops. Sebastian, a world-renowned trapeze artist, will be a huge audience draw, however. Brad therefore reluctantly gives Sebastian star billing and the center reign, taking it away from his girlfriend and trapeze star Holly, played by Betty Hutton. Despite Sebastian offering to give the center reign back, Brad refuses to let Holly have it as Sebastian's star power is too important for the show. I'm sorry, Holly, but the people watch the star. That's why the star plays the center ring. The people watch the star, do they? But well, they're going to be watching me. If you won't let him give me the center ring, I'll take it away from him. Oh, no, my sherry. I may give it away, but no one will take it away. Look, Sebastian, you're a nice guy, and I hate to do this to you, but I'm going to make ring one the center ring. If you do something once, I'll do it twice. If you do a double, I'll do a triple. If you stand on your head, I'll stand on my ear. Not while I'm around, you won't. The one place you're not around is 40 feet straight up. Maybe that's why I like it there. I'm warning you, the audiences are going to be looking at me. Thus begins the battle between Holly and Sebastian for the center ring. As the two perform riskier and riskier maneuvers to accomplish their goal, Brad worries about their safety. Holly, fully aware of Sebastian's womanizing reputation, begins falling for him, which doesn't make Brad too happy. Meanwhile, something is going on with Buttons, a clown played by Jimmy Stewart, yes, that Jimmy Stewart, who never takes off his makeup. A group of thugs are also looking to cause trouble for Brad in the circus if Brad gets in the way of them swindling the towns they travel to. The actors have two styles, stiff and cardboardy or laughably melodramatic. The worst defender in the latter category is our leading lady, Betty Hutton, who, uh, well, just watch this. Yes, so the show rolls. You don't care who it rolls over, who it hurts. So it rolls over me. Be careful someday it doesn't roll over you. Don't worry. I'll have my rigging on Senator before the great Sebastian arrives. There are sporadic moments where she dials her acting down to a subtle, believable, and skilled level, but she always devolves back into a... <gasps> then we have Charlton Heston, who may be a good actor in Wayne's World 2, but here he's not nearly as polished. There are countless bad line deliveries accompanied by teeth acting, i.e. acting where he feels the need to show off his teeth. For some reason. But, really? The bigger problem is he makes Brad so... Boring and uninteresting. He's a blank void of a character with little more to him than being stern and bossy. For most of the movie, the film forgets to give us a reason why we should care about him. If he was supposed to be sympathetic, it didn't work. If we were meant to find him unlikable but interesting, well, that didn't work either. Cadell Wilde has the most potential out of these three leads, but Sebastian isn't nearly as charismatic as the film wants him to be, and you'll fail to see why women are falling for him left and right. The problem, I guess, isn't so much wild as it is the writing and directing. DeMille zaps wild of most of his energy, and for the majority of the film's runtime, the scriptwriter gives him nothing more to work with than the standard movie womanizer character with a possible heart under the bravado and bad past. In the later stages of the movie, Wilde does get a bit more to do, and he does do a good job pulling it off with some wonderful pathos. But there's not enough there, and the writing isn't up to snuff, or bringing anything that new to the table to really make those better moments that much better. So our leading lady is overacting, and our two leading men are uninteresting, or just given nothing to work with. This is all ignoring the fact that for our love stories, Canal and Hutton share only the minutest amount of chemistry, and Hutton and Heston have... none. And when it comes to Brad, he's so eager to please and make love for her that she becomes insufferable and spineless. Well, I don't want any men. All right, then stick to the old act. Sebastian, whatever you say. Sebastian tones down, his net comes out. Thank you, 
stop fooling around up there. Sure, Priya. What about on the ground? On the ground? Oh, that reminds me. Jeannie pulled her shoulder tonight. She'll be on the ground for a while. Will you fill in with the flyers again? Of course, Priya, but you're just going to say that... Line up that pole wagon. Swing it over. Priya, on the ground. Do you want me to stop seeing it? About that dialogue, by the way, it's so bad it makes George Lucas look like William Shakespeare. Just listen to some of these lines. Oh, clowns are funny people, Holly. They only love lunch. Buttons. I'm all ache inside. Having a man whose throat is more than me. Till the next time, Jeannie. There won't be any next time. No. I think you have stardust mixed up with sawdust. You've got nothing but sawdust in your veins. I've scraped too many of you kinkers up from the sawdust to let anybody get under my skin. Those are ridiculous. But lest we forget DeMille's narration, which is extremely heavy-handed. Wheels rolling, gears grinding. A circus is gigantic power and unceasing movement. It is a restless giant, unlimbering its muscles after the long night ride. And you know what's worse? It just goes on. Bales of fireproof canvas, 58,000 pounds of it, are hauled out, unwrapped, rolled out, stretched, laid on the ground, where it lies like the skin of a mighty dismembered giant. And on. One by one, the giant's ribs rise into place and are firmly fastened in the earth. And on. Now the giant comes to life. Slowly the tons and tons of his canvas body rise and swell into the air. He starts growing to his full majestic height as he catches his first deep breath. All right, I get the point. Anyway, I'm not sure how much time DeMille spends on various superfluous circus acts, but it's a lot. This is both a good thing and a bad thing. It's nice to get away from the boring plot, but the acts often go on too long, and unless you're really interested in the circus, you'll lose interest long before they're over. If the circus, especially the old grander days depicted here, does hold a certain allure for you, then you may find something to love in The Greatest Show on Earth. DeMille teamed up with the real-life Ringling Brothers and Barnum and & Bailey Circus to create the 85 circus acts seen in the film. The Ringling Brothers lent DeMille its 1951 troupe made up of 1,400 people, hundreds of animals, and 60 carloads of equipment and tents. DeMille also required the actors to learn the circus roles of their characters, so Stuart learned how to be a clown, supporting actress Gloria Graham let a real-life elephant put its foot on her head, and, perhaps most amazingly, Hutton and Wilde actually do trapeze work. DeMille was going for lavish and authentic, and he got it. The circus acts are all done well, and this seems to be where most of the production value went. The trapeze acts are particularly noteworthy, and they are some of the few thrills you'll get out of this movie. We'll also show documentary, behind-the-scenes type footage showing how a circus is set up when it comes into town. It's a neat look behind the curtain of something most people, especially today, know little to nothing about. And when this came out, I'm sure it was a great thrill for towns where circuses didn't stop. One of the few pauses of The Greatest Show on Earth is Jimmy Stewart. He's the only actor given a good performance. He doesn't consider anybody's feelings when it comes to running the circus. You're telling me he's so mad it could spit. Well, why don't you spit then? You know, Brad's not a man, he's a machine, like the tractors and the generators. Why, Buttons, I thought you were his friend. Well, he broke his word to you. You could never trust him again. But that isn't true. Brad's been worried sick about getting us all a full season. If he had to throw me out, he had to throw me out in it. You didn't mean any of what you just said. I'll make you see it his way, Jimmy. That button storyline is genuinely intriguing. It's so good, you wish the movie was all about him instead of the dry romance and story we actually get. Sadly, Stewart's subplot is just that and is given barely any screen time. To give credit where credit is due, though, the film does get better by the end. The love story becomes somewhat interesting, you warm to Brad a bit and actually care what happens to him, and Stewart's plot is given more focus. This doesn't save the film, but it helps make it slightly worth it even if the movie still fails by a country mile to live up to its title. The Greatest Show on Earth is known by many as one of the worst, if not the worst, films ever to win Best Picture. It was quite an upset when it took home the big prize in 1953. The year's favorite was High Noon with Gary Cooper, but that film lost for two probable reasons. McCarthyism was in full swing in 1953. Party. 
and Carl Foreman, a named screenwriter and an uncredited associate producer on the film, eventually told the House Committee on Un-American Activity that he'd been a part of the American Communist Party in his younger days. Foreman became disenfranchised with the party and left it many years prior to 1953. Still, he refused to give up names of communists he knew while in the party. Deemed an uncooperative witness, he was soon blacklisted by Hollywood. DeMille, on the other hand, was a conservative involved in the National Committee for a Free Europe, an anti-communist organization which created and managed the equally anti-communist broadcast service, Radio Free Europe. So that helped. Most of DeMille's best work behind him and made before the Oscars even existed, the Academy also considered this DeMille's last chance to win the top award. So consider this DeMille's Scent of a Woman Oscar. Funny enough, DeMille's next and final film, his 1956 version of the Ten Commandments, was considered more worthy of the award than that year's winner, Around the World in 80 Days, but we'll get to that another time. For now, let's answer the big question. Is this really the worst Best Picture winner? While I've only watched 25 of the winners so far, I can safely and without a doubt say no. But in story and Jimmy Stewart's performance alone ranks it higher than the likes of 1929's The Broadway Melody and 1933's Cavalcade. It doesn't rank much higher than that though, with its stilted melodramatic acting, laughable dialogue, and boring romances. Unless you're really into the circus and wanted to see some old-timey acts done well, the good this film has is few and far between, and you should stay far away from what is hardly the greatest show on earth. Why are you in Mecca? Why are you the great Sebastian? 